John Beasley, I'm glad we could have a chance to talk about your collaboration with Chucho Valdez on La Creacion. Um, and I want to ask you about something that Chucho Valdez said, which I think is pretty impressive for somebody who was fast approaching 81. He says, this work is very significant to me. I think it's my masterpiece so far. Uh, he's going to be 81 in October. I mean, he's calling this his masterpiece so far. What does that tell you about who he is as an artist and how he's still thinking forward by saying something like so far? Uh, well, the guy lives and breathes music, you know. Um, he told me during the pandemic, he was he was still practicing, uh, you know, like six to eight hours a day, a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours after lunch, a couple hours after dinner. So that tells me something right there. He's still interested and still wanting to get better. The other thing that's interesting about Chucho is that after, you know, during the Erie years, he was the only, one of the only guys I think that stayed in Cuba. You know, Paquito, Arturo, and um, Car Carlos, they, they all left, you know, they were able to get out and left. But he had kids, he had young kids. So he stayed behind and, and you know, did sort of workman-like musician work. You know, he was a rehearsal pianist for dance troupe singers he worked in the uh you know some of the show bands so he did a lot of different non sort of uh jazzy or how, how would i say this without in insulting somebody it's good work but it's not um sort of high level artistic work right it's it's sort of craft work if you will for a musician you know to be able to transpose and and so you know it wasn't until later that he started traveling again and and, and getting out there like we know him today and I think, you know, uh, it says a lot to where, uh, you know, he, he has this continued drive and wanting to, uh, uh, to keep doing stuff because it sort of came in a way a little later for him. Do you think by virtue of him staying there longer than others that that music from Cuba is maybe perhaps more deeply felt in his blood than it might be from others who got out and heard other music and it became more of a hybrid? Could be. I mean, you know, he, he they, those guys, all those guys sought out music, you know, they were at the radio. So I don't think listening was so much of a problem. Playing it, of course, you know, they were, they were, you know, it was dangerous to play the music back then, you know, when they first started out. Right. Um, no, actually, uh, I, th I think that, that he just did that. And, you know, his solo career kind of really took off again after a little later. All right. Fair enough. So no pun intended, but when in the creation of La Creacion did you first get involved and what was your first reaction to the music? Well, I, I got uh, involved before he even started writing, actually. It was um, January of 2020, I believe. Yeah, 2020. And it was supposed to be premiered like, uh, you know, that the following fall, I guess, fall of 20, 2020 in Paris. And, you know, of course, the pandemic happened so he didn't really start writing again until I think 2021 and so I, I kind of knew what to expect uh, I knew it was at, at first I thought it was going to be an opera you know the story of um, of rhythm from basically uh, the urban culture to, to Cuba uh, Santeria up through New York up to jazz up till now you know um, uh, sung and stuff uh, so that it's turned into this suite now which I think is, is a lot more, more interesting and, and easier to travel with for sure. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he approached me about arranging it and orchestrating it, uh, you know, at the gin conference in, in New Orleans that year. Um, and then he started, he sent me a, a lead sheet, you know, uh, of the stuff. And he said, just go, man, you know, just do your thing. And so I started working on it and mocked it up for him. It's a belly and sent it back and we went back and forth a few times but you know he pretty much gave hilario and i um you know free reign in a way well how much of of this score is formally written i was able to watch the paris concert uh -huh. uh, and listen to music and i was wondering if the solos are formally written out or if there are they leave room for improvisation by the musicians oh the solos are all improvised and in fact, the first movement is, is a long sort of uh, prayer, if you will, uh, a call. And uh, 
that's improvised uh, with me and Chucho and the rhythm section. Um, Marcus on, on bass clarinet. Uh, that's probably 10 minutes at least right there, it's sort of a free thing. And, and that really mixes sort of modern elements, synthesizers with, you know, the original um, um, religious ceremony, the Santeria ceremony. Well, the nice thing is, is it means that no two performances are ever going to be the same. It's a jazz, it's a jazz piece. It's definitely improvised. Um, I mean, there's long extended percussion, you know, solos uh, and drum solos. And then Chucho's playing a lot. You were talking about the improvisational nature of of the piece. And and I you you did an interview with Jazz Times and you were talking about playing next to Herbie Hancock and watching him get lost in the music. Yeah. Um, and that that inspired you to be sort of lost in as, a, as an arranger and to arrange like an improviser. How did that thinking make its way into your work on this? Uh, sort of the same way. I mean, Chucho sent me basically a lead sheet uh, with, uh, you know, the melody, some bass lines, a tempo vibe, and said, just go. So, you know, I, I learned the piece on the piano, kind of absorbed it, and then started imagining it in my head how how, how things could, could go. Um, you know, uh, there's you know, there's there's these shout courses that happen, um, sort of backgrounds for solos, um, the way the way I kind of imagined having the the Bata ensemble mixed with Elvin Jones. That was super important for me because sort of my my two movements in the piece, other than the beginning, is our uh, you know, sort of the modern era, you know, uh, from from Cuba to New York and 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 on, you know. And um so I wanted to, you know, I, I think Elvin is super African the way he plays. And I wanted to like have that happening with the jazz beat, the jazz waltz and um, uh, stuff like that. You know, uh, like I said, you know, I so much of my arranging happens, you know, away from the computer and the piano, you know, uh, and, and I like that because I don't end up writing what I already know how to play or automatic sort of uh, this, that, you know. You know, it's it's interesting because Stephen Sondheim said he preferred to write away from the piano because when you're in front of the keyboard, you tend to fall into common habits. Yes, same thing. Yeah. Um, with a work like this, you said, you know, you, you just, you think about what the arrangement should sound like. How much do you have to think about what Chucho thinks the arrangement should sound like? What well, he wants me, to hear? All the yeah. time because I respect him, you know, it's like, you know, I, I want it, I want it. I want to do right by his vision, you know. Um, and, and in that way, it's sort of like, you know, uh, uh, when we play improvised music uh, as a pianist, part of what we do for uh, behind a soloist is 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 accompanying them, you know, uh, by 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 improvisation, right? And so this is sort of uh, another way to accompany Chucho, uh, you know, uh, by uh, so. It's 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 very similar to that. I mean, that's sort of convoluted and and, and uh, hard to explain, but that was sort of the idea. And you know, of course, I uh, you know, we go back and forth. We had Zooms. You know, we're, it was twenty twenty one, so there we had a lot of time at home to to work together on it. And um, but he's he was always you know he's a he's like Herbie in that he's a very supportive, you know. Uh, elder jazz musician if you could if you will you know uh, uh, somebody that's always uh you know building things up as opposed to no i want it this way i want it this. he's he, he's very open and um it comes through with his playing too you know he he sounds like he is well how much does your own familiarity with afro-cuban jazz have to play a part in understanding his vision and what is going to represent him. I mean, do you do, do a deep dive into what he's done previously? Because it seems to me as an artist, he's constantly moving forward and not looking back. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I've listened to him for years. I was a big Eric Curry fan, you know, when I was a kid and and then, you know, all these trio records. And um, so I did a deep dive. I mean, I've been, I've been playing Afro-Cuban music for a long time. And I've been I've witnessed all the clave wars and beyond, and um, uh, I'm not 
saying I'm an expert at it, but I, I do have experience in that. And in fact, uh, even before this project, I uh, one of the first things I do when I get a tempo in my head, uh, either to practice to or to write to, is I, I program clave. So even if it's a funk thing or a jazz thing or or anything, I still write to clave. Um, so yeah, I did that with this, of course. I put a Roomba clave in and went to work. What stands out to you most about what, what Chucho Valdez has accomplished with, with this piece? Uh, wow. Well, the breadth of it is more enormous. You know, to put this many people together and have this vision of, of vocals, uh, Santeria uh, um, ceremony, um, you know, a bata ensemble with a full Latin jazz ensemble with a big band, two arrangers, two, two music directors, two other keyboard players, you know, um, that's a big, that's a big job, you know, and to do it for his 80th birthday, you know, in fact, I, I'm still amazed at all the stuff, different stuff he does all the time, you know, uh, the tour where we premiered this work in, in, uh, in last November, um, um, we did a, we premiered it in Paris, um, and the next day we, we did a whole different show of, uh, a birthday celebration show you know, with different people, different music, you know, it's just, it's just amazing, you know, and, and he's very gracious and uh, he's an amazing person, man. He, he, people are going to really sense his humanity, I think, when they see this piece. No, it's, it, it's a pretty remarkable piece. And, and I'm wondering since that premiere in Paris, how how has your relationship to the piece evolved? I mean, you were involved from before you started writing. Now you've you've you're going on a tour where you're going to be performing at you know multiple dates across the United States. Has your relationship evolved with this work, and has your thought process about what it can be and what it is as a living, breathing thing changed? Oh yeah, we we were just in Detroit last weekend, weekend before last, Detroit Jazz Festival. And we played it with a with a a, a group of really great uh, local Detroit musicians, and we rehearsed it again, and we started messing with it. Of course, this is what we do. We 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 have new ideas, so uh, you know. And because everybody's a jazz musician that that was in the ensemble, including the big band, we're able to dictate stuff by singing, elongating sessions sections, shortening shortening sections. You know, it's evolved for sure. You know, everybody's, and I can even hear how everybody's playing had it had evolved since last November to now, including Chuch. Do you, do you have a, a different emotional response to the work at this point? Yeah, I'm, you know, much more familiar with how uh, it's being interpreted on a nightly basis and being, being inspired, you know, because the, the more we get ourselves off the page and absorb it, then more of our our own particular personalities come out of it. And that's that's a beautiful thing, especially with the large ensemble. When that happens with the large ensemble, then you know you got something happening. Yeah, and it's such a, you know, I mean, I was so thrilled to be able to find the video online because mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to be at the concert next week because I'll be out of town, mm -hmm. um, which, which is a drag. But one of the things I really loved was watching the respect different parts of the ensemble gave other parts, other musicians in differing parts of the ensemble and just like they would watch them as almost like they were an audience as much as they were members of the same ensemble. I mean, you know, you got something working when you've got musicians paying that much attention to each other, not just in terms of listening as, as, you know, a partner, but actually just turning and watching in some cases and even yeah, digging on everybody hard, man. And that <laughs> starts at the top. That's, that's a thing. Chucho, that's how Chucho is. You know, he's always like, you know, listening to guys and smiling when he's playing. And, and um, you know, like I said, he's a very supportive artist. What stood out to you most about that first performance where you where you premiered the work in front of an audience? Well, that's an incredibly beautiful hall. You know, uh, the outside is is crazy looking, but the inside really sounds great. 
Uh, we had a day to rehearse in the hall before that and really get the sound tweaked in. Um, I mean, to premiere a work in Paris is about as good as it gets, right? Yeah. I'm, of course, born and raised in Los Angeles. I'm a little partial to LA, but Paris is pretty damn good. Well, you got to figure, you know, the history of, of, of the works that have gotten, you know, you think of Stravinsky, mm -hmm. uh, thinking, you know, you know, I'm sure Ravel and, you know, go back, it goes back a little further than, than uh, the LA Phil, you know? Well, most go, well, it goes back further than Los Angeles. Forget the LA Phil. Right. It goes back further. But in Los Angeles, you're going to be playing at the Hollywood Bowl which means if it sells out 18,000 people can hear this piece. And I'm wondering how a venue makes a difference in how you present this music or how, what energy you get from that venue that, that infuses its way into the performance. Cause the hall in Paris was significantly smaller than the Hollywood bowl. Yeah. Um, it's not about size. It's about people, you know, um, and and uh, yeah, Paris was amazing because it was the premiere, and he's very popular in France. France has always embraced not only jazz but Afro-Cuban music for sure. Um, and the bowl is a different animal, you know. It's it's um, it's so famous worldwide and so big and so beautiful. Everybody gets up for that. But the challenge of the bowl is that is that sometimes in that inner circle, you're you're kind of far away from you know, some of the fans that are, that, that are maybe there for, to really see you. Right. So, um, but despite that it's uh, the crew and, you know, I've been working at the bowl a long time and the crew and the way it's set up, um, uh, it sounds great on stage. They, they're, they're always tweaking, uh, the sound and making it better, not only for the listeners, but for the, for the musicians themselves. It's it's always an up. You get up for the bowl. You know, it's it's one of those iconic Carnegie Hall type places to play. So if I don't know if 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 La Creation has been recorded formally yet, but if it does get recorded, what is the best scenario for this piece to be presented to reflect what it what it is and what you and Chucho and others have have created? Well, that's interesting because. Because it is, it evolves every night. It's different. It's every night. It, every night is different. Um, so, you know, you could argue that a live recording would be would be really great because, you know, we feed off the audience. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of moving parts. It's a large ensemble. So getting everybody in one place is sort of a challenge. But, you know, something about that energy, live energy, it would be great. On the other hand, to to really be able to um, to uh, to work on multiple takes and and uh, uh, you know punch in certain sections to really make it uh, you know uh, for lack of a better word tighter or or whatever. Uh, it's not that the live is not tighter; it's just a different animal. You know, uh, you, you have a lot more control in the studio. Get a nice mix going. You know, I, I don't know if there's an answer for that, you know. Um, lately, you know, in the in the world of YouTube and everybody really you know, seeing a lot of music that's been recorded live, even with a phone, you know, I think that that um, people are used to to hearing live live music with with its sort of even with its so-called flaws, you know, you know, I think the energy sort of compensates for maybe a weird mix or a, you know a mistake here and there or whatever you know well that's that's the that's the beauty and curse i guess of live recordings is it just is what it is in that moment yes given given this this foundation of this piece with la regla de ocha um what role does music play from your perspective not just in Engaging the solar experience, but perhaps explaining or demonstrating the religious traditions of Africa that made their way to Cuba in the 19th century. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, the slave trade, number one, you know, and 
you know, that still has to be illuminated. Still, people still don't don't get that. That's heartbreaking. Um, number two, you can eliminate also the fact that uh, the reason why the African diaspora in, in the states is sounds different, and that's because the slave owners didn't allow drumming; they were afraid of it, right? So, gospel music happens. And, you know, after slavery, you know, reconstruction instruments, you know, uh, European instruments. So, depends what we jazz and R and B and and gospel music, and in Brazil, how how uh, sort of the same thing happened. You know, the 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 uh, the ideal of superimposing deities, African deities, and onto Christian saints. You know, it's all over Brazil. It's all over South America. So in that way, the illumination of that, and also the to me the this is the sheer uh, what's the right word I'm looking for the the force, the human force, the the greatest thing about human suffering and through all the suffering and setbacks, how uh the sur the survival with this soul intact this this beautiful art form intact survived all that horror that's amazing you know and also it's amazing that 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 um there's not as much bitterness and anger as there certainly could be yeah, it's amazing that so much great music and music traditions came out of such horrible circumstances. Yeah, grace. It's it's complete grace. Yeah. Something I think we could use a lot more of in the world today. Indeed, indeed. So you obviously have your own music that you've recorded, obviously with, with the orchestra. Thelonious Monk is, a, is, you know, an important figure for you. What does doing this Afro-Cuban music with Chucho Valdes give you that doing your own music or Thelonious Monk doesn't? Oh, uh, well, to me, I, I hopefully I absorb this and continue on, you know? I mean, man, I got to tell you, man, uh, not only arranging and conducting with Chucho, but actually playing as a pianist, or uh, in this case, I'm playing electric keyboards, but playing music, with Chucho was quite illuminating as well. To be on stage with him and him hearing what I'm doing and looking up and 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 uh, the conversation, you know, that and and also watching him play backstage, you know, behind him as a as just just sheer pianist, you know. I go home and I go, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that, you know. So yeah, there's many levels of uh, inspiration for me to take to take on have you imagined what it what it might have been like to to be on stage with Thelonious Monk um sure sure I, I can imagine that um actually we have this cinematic project um that we actually premiered at at, the, at Disney Hall a few years ago I found uh footage of Thelonious playing on a tour and uh videoed by uh Michael Blackwood in the 60s and uh so shot on film it's really great so i was able to uh to 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 write monkestra charts with Thelonious playing and i took it to a uh, an ad uh, adr guy who works on movies here was had software where I was able to strip out the bass and drums if i wanted to and and uh click it and our band played with monk on a big screen you know so yeah i can imagine that <laughs> I've done it in a way. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I want to conclude our conversation, John, by asking you about something that Thelonious Monk said. He said, whatever you think can't be done, somebody will come along and do it. A genius is the one most like himself. What have you and Chucho Valdes and Hilario Duran accomplished with La Creacion? And how do you think your work has allowed you to be the most like yourself? And perhaps by extension, according to Monk, a genius. Well, for the gift that Chucho gave Hilario and, our, and us to take his music and, 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 and do our thing to it, be ourselves. Like I said, it starts at, it starts at the top. Chucho knows that, you know, 
he's a true artist and he knows this what exactly what you're saying and he knows to get the best out of somebody and his own work he has to give up sort of a part of himself and let it pay forward to the next step of the process and he did that um and that's a lesson you know i mean that, that's one of the best things about leading a big band that i sometimes do is you know i i the pressure is off me sometimes you know you know there's so many great musicians in the band to let them go and do their thing and embrace embrace the music as they hear it you know it, it really takes a lot of pressure off you and you can have fun and, and 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 sort of expand on what they're doing and be yourself you know yeah does that make sense it does it does make sense so would so do you think chucho valdez is a genius yeah i mean genius is a uh sure yeah listen to how he plays and how he communicates yeah totally you know and he doesn't sound like anybody else he can sound like other people but at well, this age of him man you you just and it's just it's just pure it's just somehow it's just coming out pure but it's not to say you know monk can say this and and but monk also put tons of hours into this and so is chucho you know sure you can be you can have the talent of a genius but unless you put the hours in you know the flow of the genius is, will not be the same very well said and a great place to end this thank you so much for your time john thank you craig i had a great time talking to you man